Hello, my name is Dr. Christy Hensel. I'm an attending physician and director of the inpatient spinal cord injury services at the Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center. The title of my talk is Identification and Management of Spinal Cord Injury Related Emergencies. I feel that this is an important um, issue which many internists may not be aware of due to the infrequency of their interactions with individuals with spinal cord injury. I hope you find this to be a valuable addition to your clinical um, education. Thanks. It is my pleasure to introduce our grand run speaker for today, Dr. Christy Hensel. Dr. Hensel received her bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Vanderbilt University. She then completed a PhD in physiology and biophysics at the University of Louisville. After finishing her PhD, Dr. Hensel enrolled in medical school and graduated from the University of Louisville in 2006. She went on to complete her residency training uh, in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Hensel then moved to Cleveland and completed a year of advanced fellowship in spinal cord research at Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center with a focus on chronic wound healing. She completed another clinical fellowship in spinal cord injury medicine at the Metro Health Medical Center in 2012. Since 2012, Dr. Hensel has worked as an attending physician at the Louis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center and currently serves there as the director of the spinal cord injury services. Dr. Hensel has received numerous awards and scholarships throughout her medical career. She is also a member of several professional societies and has served on various medical uh, committees. She has published many peer-reviewed articles and currently serves as, as a reviewer for the American jo uh, Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Today, Dr. Hensel will talk to us about identification and management of spinal cord injury-related medical emergencies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christy Hensel. Well, thank you everyone for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I wanted to just verify that I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And um, these are the learning objectives. Identification of autonomic dysreflexia as a major cause of morbidity and mortality for people with spinal cord injuries above neurological levels T6 and above. Describe the etiology of the elevated blood pressure in autonomic dysreflexia and the appropriate treatment approaches. And finally, understanding options for treatment of mucus plugging in the setting of neurogenic respiratory insufficiency and failure. So first um, question that I have for all of you is, um, do you think spinal cord injury is considered a rare disease? How many of you have more than five uh, patients with spinal cord injury that you've treated? I see a few hands, great. So by definition, if there are fewer than 200,000 in the United States, fewer than 200,000 Americans at a given time with a disease or disorder, it's considered rare. Now, when we think about this in the context of spinal cord injury, it turns out that the incidence of spinal cord injury is about 12,000 new cases per year. And this does not include anyone who died at the scene of a traumatic spinal cord injury. So these are the people that survived for at least 24 hours. It turns it works out to be about 40 new cases per million population. And if you think about the Cleveland metro area, we have about a 2 million um, population. So we would expect to see about 80 new cases in this you know, catchment per year. And of course, a lot of those are going to go to Metro Health, um, some at UH, and fewer at the clinic. Um, and then are there are a few that are scattered at um, you know, community hospitals and hopefully, but not always, we just found, are getting transferred into the major medical centers and trauma centers. But it turns out that the prevalence of spinal cord injury is estimated, um, as of the, the most recent numbers in 2013, at around 270,000 people. So while we're not officially a rare disease, we're pretty rare. So um, this brings me to you know, a very common you know, adage that I remember when I was a med student trying to diagnose my, my patient with hypertension with theochromocytoma. You know, my attendant said, you know, when you hear the sound of hoofbeats in the night, Think first of horses and not zebras. But when, um, say, a resident is rotating over at the VA or you're dealing with a patient with a higher level of spinal cord injury, I think you have to recognize that 
your typical approach to things like hypertension and respiratory management may not be exactly the same. So it just may not apply for persons with spinal cord injury. So I want to introduce why your residency is special. Um, so most patients um, that you encounter obviously are neurologically intact. Because the VA has the spinal cord injury and disorder system of care, every resident that rotates at the VA has a very unique opportunity to be exposed to the care of patients with spinal cord injury. Um, this was formalized by the VA in 1996. And the premise was that there are unique health issues and special medical services that are required for the appropriate care of individuals with spinal cord injury. The format of the system is um, a hub and spokes relationships with spinal cord injury centers that draw patients in from a catchment area, which are their, their spokes. And these are the primary care teams. And the goal is to provide not just acute rehabilitation services, but a coordinated lifelong continuum of services for those veterans who have spinal cord injury. And so, for example, um, when you see patients with spinal cord injury at the Cleveland VA, they could be coming from Michigan, New York, West Virginia, even Kentucky. Um, but you really have a chance to meet and learn from patients that you, you may not encounter otherwise. So it really expands your clinical knowledge um, if you're able to take advantage of that opportunity. So the mission of the VA um, SCIV system is supporting and maintaining health, independence, quality of life, and productivity of individuals with spinal cord injury and disorders throughout their lives. And we accomplish these objectives through rehabilitation, medical and surgical care, patient and family education, because as you're aware, someone may or may not be able to be fully independent. They may need assistance in order to live um, independently in the community. Um, psychological, vocational care, education, and professional training. So that's part of why I'm here today, is to help um, expand knowledge of the medical emergencies that impact our patients. So the patients that you might see at the Cleveland VA include patients with traumatic spinal cord injuries, non-traumatic spinal cord injuries, such as those that related to cervical myelopathy and spondylosis, um, patients with multiple sclerosis who have cord involvement, as well as patients with um, ALS, which definitely qualifies as a rare disease. Um, however, it turns out it's more common in veterans, um, and so we also have a number of those patients uh, for you guys to see. <coughs> Our Admissions are, are quite variable as well. So some patients are rehab patients. They're freshly out from their injury. They may have problems with DVTs or PEs. Um, there are patients who are admitted who have an old spinal cord injury, who have chronic conditions, um, which then have exacerbations. Um, we have respite care, and we also do annual evaluations to hopefully catch things before they become acute problems. So the two medical emergencies that I'd like to talk to you about today are autonomic dysreflexia, which is an acute hypertensive event, and mucus plugging, which may contribute to respiratory distress and or failure. So there are many areas of autonomic dysfunction after a spinal cord injury. Um, so it not only impacts the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system, but also the GI tract, the lower urinary tract, sexual function, sweating, and thermoregulation. Obviously today, I'm going to focus, focus on the first two of these, and we'll do a little bit of a physiology talk to kind of understand better where this is coming from. So to start with this, we'll do um, a little discussion of the anatomy as a refresher in case you're not on top of all of the sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. So the innervation of the heart for the autonomics comes from T1 through T5 for the sympathetic component, the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, obviously, for the parasympathetics, which I think is the thing people remember really well about autonomic function in the heart. But there, and there's no somatic motor innervation. Obviously, the heart's going to interact with the blood vessels. And the blood vessel innervation for sympathetics comes, again, similar to the heart, from T1 through T5 for the upper extremities. And for the lower body, it exits via the sympathetic chain from T5 to L2. And that 
cutoff is very important because it involves the splenic circulation, um, which, as you're aware, is you know the primary resistance bed in the in the body. Um, so parasympathetic innervation to blood vessels is pretty limited to glands and erectile tissue. So that's going to come through cranial nerve um, 10 for the parasympathetic to sal saliva and the GI tract, and S1 through S4 parasympathetics to the genital erectile tissue, and again, no somatic motor input to the blood vessels. For the bronchopulmonary system, T1 through T5 sympathetic output, vagal parasympathetic output, and somatic motor um, from C3 to T12. So let's talk a little bit about um, cardiovascular dysfunction after spinal cord injury. And we'll start out with what's normal, okay? Especially the med students should, should get all of this. Um, so if you recall, the ability of, of myself to stand here and talk to you today without passing out is largely incumbent upon my tonic sympathetic tone, which constricts the blood vessels in the periphery and allows me to maintain my blood pressure. And this will, you know, just as we said, exit to my heart at T1 through T5 and to the lower body exiting the chain at T5 through L2. Any parasympathetic management is going to happen via vag vagal input. And this is all um, coordinated at the level of the medulla um, through the dorsal motor nucleus of 10, the nucleus ambiguous for the um, parasympathetic in and out flow for the baroreceptor reflex. And the rostral ventral lateral medulla regulates the sympathetic um, tone. Now, when someone has a spinal cord injury, a couple things happen. So we've, we've cut off our sympathetic um, stimulatory tone to the lower body. And this causes neurogenic shock. So patients have a sudden vasodilatation. They um, have warm extremities. Their blood pressure is very low. And this can be quite life-threatening in the short term. Fortunately, it tends to resolve over two to six weeks. Um, but even after that, people with higher level spinal cord injury above about T5, um, T6, tend to have lower than what we would call normal resting blood pressures, and they're susceptible to orthostatic hypotension because they cannot basically constrict the periphery and especially the splanchnic beds to boost their blood pressure in response to uh, orthostatic challenge. Furthermore, when we're talking about autonomic dysreflexia, we have to be aware uh, that the spinal cord below the level of injury is not dead. It's still there, and it's still active. The inner neurons are still there. Reflexes still work. This is why you know, many of our patients develop spasticity. Um, and some of them who have incomplete injuries are still able to ambulate or have some motor control. But the key thing that I want to point out here is that Sensory afferent, nox um, afferent stimulation from noxious stimuli will set up um, stimulatory reflexes within the cord that lead to peripheral um, constriction of the splanchnic bed, thereby re leading to a sometimes very massive increase in blood pressure, which unfortunately, due to the lack of supraspinal inhibitory um, input from the injury itself, you're unable to autoregulate this. So we're stuck with the parasympathetic component of the baroreceptor reflex. So we're able to lower our heart rate in response to elevated blood pressure. But we're not able to modulate the peripheral vasoconstriction as the body normally would. And this is ultimately what leads to um, autonomic dysreflexia. So just a reminder for um, med students, because you guys might get this in one of your tests, is um, if we think about Ohm's law relating to the pressure and flow relationship in the circulation, resistance is a big part of pressure changes. So the change in pressure is equivalent to flow times resistance, and the resistance is inversely proportional to the uh, fourth power of the radius of the blood vessel. So if you make that blood vessel really small, the resistance really goes up. And I know um, you all remember this from physiology. Okay, it turns out that the baroreceptor reflex 
may malfunction in more than one way. Aside from um, the sympathetic depending, the descending pathway disruption, preliminary research is showing that there may also be um, dysfunction that's occurring within the baroreceptor uh, sensory component as well due to arterial stiffening. And this may be happening in response to decreased activity. So you're having less changes in blood pressure because people typically don't exercise as much. So you tend to get arterial wall stiffening, which may um, lead to the aortic arch baroreceptor stretching less and having less input to the system. Um, it turns out there may also be alterations in the integration at the nucleus of the tractus solitarius. And there also may be um, problems with sinoatrial node transmission. So how would you define autonomic dysreflexia in a patient with spinal cord injury? We define it as a sudden systolic or diastolic blood pressure elevation that is 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury above baseline. So this above baseline part of the definition is key. So if I have C5 tetraplegia and my resting blood pressure is 90 over 60, which is not uncommon. If I walk in with a blood pressure of 125 or 130 and say a headache, that's a problem. That's not something to say, oh, 130, no big deal. Okay, um, because when you don't recognize autonomic dysreflexia early, it tends to get worse. So, we already talked about the noxious stimuli causing the constriction of the splanking beds and the high blood pressure. Um, one key to also look for is that this frequently also occurs with bradycardia. So you can see the baroreceptor reflex, uh, bar reflex trying to work through the, blood, uh, through the heart rate, but it's just not going to be quite enough to fix the problem. So people who are at risk for autonomic dysreflexia, by and large, these are people whose level of injury is at or above T6. Um, this is not to say that if someone has a T7 or a T8 level injury, they cannot have autonomic dysreflexia. It can happen, I've seen it. So everybody has slightly different anatomical variants. And so this accounts for variability, but if you look at statistically, if you have a patient above T6, plan on this being part, something that you want to account for in, your, in your, your plan of care. And again, their baseline systolic pressures may range from 90 to 110. Um, and it affects 90% of people with complete motor or cervical injuries. For people with motor incomplete injuries, it's unfortunately mixed, and I cannot give you a number. Um, there was a recent review, and, and we just cannot say somebody with this incomplete spinal cord injury doesn't have autonomic dysreflexia. So there's a mix, and the impact on the autonomic completeness versus the neurologic completeness, which is you know looking at light touch, pinprick, and motor function, it doesn't look at autonomics at all. There's not a lot of correlation there. And so why should you care about AD? Like, oh, their pressure's 130. They'll probably be fine. And maybe, maybe they will. But um, so well-known um, so sequelae of AD, heart attacks, retinal hemorrhages, um, seizures and encephalopathy, endocranial hemorrhage, and of course, death. So I don't want any of you guys to be on the end of an m, &M that says, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you address this problem? So that's part of why I'm here today. Um, so death is not that common from AD. It's been reported in the literature. Um, and this review from just this year, is quite handy during this presentation. Um, Krasikov et al. Um, identified 26 manuscripts that um, identified 32 total life-threatening complications or death associated with AD. And this was in a review of the literature from 1965 to 2009, if I recall correctly. They reviewed um, 156 papers, and of these, the complications described um, were life-threatening in those 32. 
So most of them were hemorrhagic um, CNS complications. There were cerebral ischemia and infarction in four cases, and seizures in nine cases. Amongst the cardiovascular complications, there was one arrest, which was likely um, secondary to bradycardia, um, five arrhythmias, and one silent MI. And of course, this is just what was reported. At this point, if I have an AD episode, I'm not going to write it up, okay? Um, but this is what's reported in the literature. Seven of those cases resulted in death. Six were related to the, cardi uh, the um, central nervous system dysfunction, and one was secondary to neurogenic pulmonary edema. Um, and I thought this was a really nice paper because it um, also kind of it had this great figure, which I, I copied here. Um, so this is a case of autonomic dysreflexia accompanied by arrhythmia in a 48-year-old man. He had incomplete spinal cord injury. So he's a C3 Asia C, meaning that he has motor function um, below the level of his injury, but less than half of the muscles are a greater than or equal to a, a three. So he's got strength, but it's really not anti-gravity for the most part. And he was having um, vibrostimulation in the OR for sperm retrieval. And after they, so his baseline pressures, I believe, were around um, 119 over, um, I think, 70. But once they started the vibro stimulation, you can really see the blood pressure climbing. And the peak blood pressures during that uh, procedure were as high as um, 300 for systolics. And even after the procedure, 10 minutes, he maintained a higher, a higher pressure. Now, the really fascinating thing about this that I didn't put on the slide because I didn't want to give it away was that they pre-treated him 20 minutes before the procedure with 5 milligrams of nifedipine. And he still bumped his pressure this much. So this is a very, very powerful response to noxious stimuli that can occur. Um, the second figure from, the, from that article that I'd like to, to bring to your attention is this box plot. So this compared the patients who um, did and didn't die, I'm sorry, did die and didn't die um, from their autonomic dys dysreflexia. So not all of those cases that they reported had blood pressure um, measures available. But of those that did, these were their analyses. So the average blood pressure reported in patients who died was only 214. Um, because the most likely reason for this is that the cardiovascular system becomes used to the low pressures that are typical and therefore a higher blood pressure um, can still cause a pretty severe reaction. Um, and 181 was the average pressure in the patients that survived their episode of autonomic dysreflexia. Unfortunately, the statistical analysis wasn't significant, but it was a P equal 0 0.58, so it's pretty close. But um, there are many etiologies of autonomic dysreflexia. The strongest, by and large, are distension of a viscous. So distended bladder, distended bowel. Um, Constrictive clothing, wrinkles in sheets can cause autonomic dysreflexia, malpositioning in the bed. We had a gentleman in the SICU just last week whose leg was just bent funny um, and his pressure was over 200. Um, and the med student fixed it, by the way. Um, scrotal compression, urinary tract uh, abnormalities, infections, and stones. Uh, stomach ulcers, sunburns, and grown toenails, and pain. Um, also, things like DVTs and PEs, gallstones, anything that you can think of that might cause pain can cause AD. Um, sometimes, when we have someone with autonomic dysreflexia where we can't figure out what's triggering it, we have to basically go down this list and try and try to figure out what is going wrong. And it sometimes takes a while. Um, we had a gentleman in the MICU at the VA for how long before you figured it out? I want to say it was at least a month. A month with encephalopathy um, and seizures in the MICU with nitro drip before a PICC line um, chest x-ray happened to identify a humeral fracture. We stabilized the humeral fracture, we treated pain, his pressure came down. But it really takes a thorough survey sometimes to identify the cause. 
And um, in your female patients with spinal cord injury, um, this can include menstruation, obviously pregnancy and labor and delivery, which are typically done with spinal anesthesia for this exact reason, as well as such sexual intercourse and ejaculation can cause AD. So it's a real mix of things. The signs and symptoms that you want to watch out for with AD, aside from the blood pressure change, bradycardia. Now, not everyone has bradycardia. Some people have tachycardia. They tend to be people that are in between T5 and say T7 that have the tachycardia, but um, by and large you may see bradycardia. Patients will complain of pounding headaches. They'll complain of nasal congestion. They frequently have profuse sweating. You might think somebody's having a heart attack. They're just drenched in sweat. Usually that is right at the level of injury and above because the sweating is abnormal below that level. They may have um, goosebumps. They are frequently flushed and blotchy. And it's really fascinating when you look at someone and you're like, boom, they're, they're just red from here up. Um, they may have vision changes with blurry vision and spots. They may have feelings of anxiety, or someone described it once as a sense of impending doom. Um, and there are cardiac arrhythmias, but there are also patients that have no symptoms. And those are the ones that I really worry about, especially when they're living in the community. Because we have what we call silent AD, and they, they can be really, really challenging to, um, to treat. So what I'm going to go over in terms of treatment come from two clinical practice guidelines that were um, created by the Consortium for Spinal Cord Injury Medicine. Um, one is the acute management of autonomic dysreflexia, and one is respiratory management following spinal cord injury. And these are available for free online at the Paralyzed Veterans of America website. And um, if you're ever at the VA or just have any questions, feel free to email me or page me, and I can show you how to link to it. So ideally, if you're dealing with what you suspect is autonomic dysreflexia, you want to identify and remove the cause. And if we're unable to entirely remove the cause, then we want to treat the blood pressure, which might include things like pain management. <laughs> um, so for the residents who are at the VA now, just please keep in mind, we um, request that if you have admitted our patient, that you please um, place an order for the AD protocol. Um, for those patients at risk with spinal cord injury. So if they're above T6 and you're admitting them, you know, late at night from the ED, just try to remember to put that AD protocol in. And we have attendings on call who can talk you through it if need be. But um, this is in the spinal cord injury admission order set. So the, our, pers our AD protocol at the Cleveland VA was derived from the Spinal Cord Consortium, CPGs, as well as the Spinal Cord Injury Model System guidelines. So number one, nursing will start checking blood pressures, and they'll do that every about five minutes. Number one thing is to sit your patient up. So this is taking advantage of the orthostatic hypotension problems that these same patients have, so you're protecting the brain by doing that. Loosening clothing, checking their positioning, removing any shoes, splinting, anything that's restrictive that could be removed, as well as performing skin checks, checking any tubes, so is the fully draining. Um, do they have a peg that needs to be burped? Is their abdomen distended? Um, those things, checking the bladder and catheters. And then if you can get the blood pressure below 150, or let's say it's 135, um, you can check the bowel. Because just checking the bowel is painful and can um, make the AD worse. So we try not to do that unless systolic pressures are already at less than 150 using medication, so lidocaine gel. And then the other intervention that we do, because it is readily reversible, is the use of nitro paste. So for systolic pressures above 150, we'll give an inch of nitro paste, and then once the AD episode is resolving, we wipe it off, and, um, and we're all good. We try to give patients access to medical alert cards that they can bring with them into an emergency room setting, for example, or their primary care office. Um, and one part that I want to focus on here is that in some centers, um, they will have patients take an immediate release nifedipine, not sublingual, which can cause, um, ex I would say, emergently low blood pressure. But um, 
We have not used that at the Cleveland VA um, due to pharmacy regulations and concerns with short-acting nifedipine. But um, the nitro paste works pretty well, so that's a good trick to have up your sleeve without worrying about crashing their blood pressure for too long afterward. But there are patients who have longer problems with um, AD, maybe they have a problem that we can't fix, who may need longer term antihypertensives until whatever it is resolves. Um, okay, so here I'll just give you an example of a case, and it's actually pretty easy to fix. So a 54-year-old male with c sex tetraplegia is admitted with pneumonia. He's a night float admission to a medical floor, but will be transferred to spinal cord injury in the morning. And at 3 a.m., the resident's paged, reporting that his blood pressure is 200 over 90. And blood pressure was 90 over 60 when you admitted him. So what do you do next? Um, let's see, where do the med students and residents sit? Back row? Yeah? OK. So um, the young woman um, sitting on the edge of the stairs, what would you do first? Okay, that's a good start. What you want to do um, next is, is do all those early interventions, and in this case it was found that the patient was turned on top of his Foley tubing, and after repositioning, 600 mLs of urine came out, and the blood pressure dropped back down. It can be as simple as that, okay? So um, just remember, if you see our patients and their blood pressure is high, don't automatically think meds, think, what can, I, what can I do here? What can I physically do with my hands, okay? <clears throat> so then, moving on to pulmonary dysfunction after spinal cord injury. Um, we'll review briefly um, somatic innovations of the respiratory system. So the main respiratory muscles are obviously the diaphragm, intercostals, and the abdominals. For patients who are levels C1 and C2, clearly the diaphragm is paralyzed, ventilators or diaphragmatic pacing systems are required to sustain life. For those with injuries between C3 and C5, the diaphragm is partially denervated. So this um, affects their inspiration, which is weak, but they may or may not require um, ventilation, usually starting around C4. Um, and when we talk about spinal cord injury levels, you have to keep in mind that sometimes there's a sensory level which may be above the motor level. And if their motor level is creeping into that C5, C6 area, then there's a greater chance that they're going to be able to be ventilator free. Um, for those patients C6 through C8, your diaphragm is good, but your inspiration and your expiration are impaired due to the lack of innervation to the internal and the external intercostals. And even for our paraplegic patients who are level T1 through T12, the denervated um, intercostals have an impact here, um, primarily impacting expiration more than inspiration. Um, for those who are lower, T7 through L2, where it's mainly abdominal muscles that are impacted, these patients have ineffective cough. They may still be prone to pneumonias, um, simply because it's more difficult for them to clear secretions than a neurologically intact individual. So going back to our anatomy, um, similarly here, there is innervation to the trachea and the bronchial tree from the vagus nerve Okay, and the laryngeal nerve. And these will you know, go to the tracheal plexus before they'll go to the um, airway itself. Phrenic nerve exiting um, C3 through C5 for um, humans. Some of these images are actually um, either a rat and kind of mixed with human. I didn't mention that the first time around, but they're, they're pretty close. Um, and then we have the somatic motor out for T1 through T12. Um, and 
the main thing to keep in mind here is that the cholinergic stimulation of the vagus can cause bronchoconstriction. So sometimes we get a mixed picture where you might have excess vagal tone and you're actually having the respiratory symptoms go along with that. Okay? Um, the respiratory dysfunction following the spinal cord injury is pretty broad. Pneumonia, atelectasis, bronchitis, neurogenic restrictive airway syndrome, and then you combine that with the COPD or the sleep apnea that they may have on top of um, this simply because, you know, for veterans especially, a lot of them have a long smoking history. Um, they may have respiratory insufficiency, dyspnea on exertion, and respiratory problems are the primary um, cause of death in patients with spinal cord injury at this point in time, primarily pneumonia and influenza. But uh, the biggest medical emergency with regard to respiratory problems are mucus plugs. And I've seen this impact not just our true spinal cord injured patients, I've seen it in our MS patients. Um, the patients are short of breath, we do a um, chest x-ray, maybe one whole lung is, is whited out. And we've had cardiothoracic surgery called because they thought it was a pleural effusion. And it turned out that really it was a mucus plug, the mucus plug needed to be removed, the patient recovered very quickly um, with aggressive pulmonary toileting. Um, patients can also be misdiagnosed with pulmonary emboli or pneumonia. And again, um, if a patient has sleep apnea, they're going to be even more prone to this because they don't have good um, respiratory turnover. So the treatment for mucus plugging um, is number one, aggressive pulmonary toileting. Both I mean, ideally, I have it going during their entire stay, especially if they're coming in for any kind of respiratory reason or if they're early after their spinal cord injury. So these patients, I keep on um, positive pressure therapies and nebulizers for the new patients for the first several months until they've kind of proved themselves. And we actually typically will try to track the first vital capacity um, daily to follow how they're doing. Um, one thing to remember is bronchoscopy is not always necessary. And this is huge because, you know, if somebody thinks, well, make this blood, right? Maybe you've got to call pulmonary, they need a bronch. They may not. And that's because of some of the tools available to us, which we use in spinal cord injury a lot. And I'm not sure how frequently they're utilized in the neurologically intact population. My, my impression, because I had never heard of it when I was an intern, is that it's not, not highly used. So two of the things that are, are frequently used is the chest vest, which I remember being used a lot in um, patients with um, ah. CF. CF, thank you. Like, you can tell how far away I am from Pete. Um, for CF, the metanabs treatments, which is the same thing as the um, IPPB. Um, so continuous high frequently os oscillation with positive pressure pulses and then continuous positive respiratory pressure, usually alternating these about two and a half minutes on, switch to something else, switch to something else. And it can be combined with nebulizer treatments, although at the VA, our therapists tend to pre-treat with nebulizers to avoid any reflex space or, or buccal constriction. And then my really big go-to is, um, in addition to the easy pap and the bronchodilators, is what's called mechanical insufflation exsufflation. We, um, the other name for this is the cofflator. And this little device, um, you can see it has a green half and a yellow half to the dial. And essentially, what we train, especially our high level patients to do with the help of their caregiver or their family, is regularly do a clearing cough. So, and here it has it with a a face mask. So it can be used with a face mask. It can be used with a mouthpiece. It can also obviously be used with a, a trach adapter. And a lot of respiratory therapists say, oh, it can only be used with a trach adapter. There's no point in using it with a mouthpiece or a face mask. 
And I am here to tell you that that is not true. And there are patients that use it at home with the mouthpiece or the face mask, and they have very effective um, results. So just because the patient doesn't have a trach doesn't mean you can't use this. In any case, the therapy is um, a positive pressure inflation up to 40 centimeters of water, followed about two seconds later by negative pressure. So same, negative, negative 40 centimeters of water. So it actually will suck the mucus right out of the um, respiratory tree. And we sometimes have to do uh, repeated courses of this, but I find it to be incredibly effective. It also helps open up the lungs. Um, obviously, some contraindications would be um, ARDS, something where you're really worried about a parenchymal injury. But the thing to keep in mind about people with spinal cord injury, especially in the acute setting, is that let's say they had a traumatic injury and the chest wasn't involved. There's nothing wrong with their lungs. Okay? There's something wrong with their muscles. It's a neuromuscular disorder. It is not an intraparenchymal disorder. So people have sometimes been low to touch this when really this is what's going to prevent them developing atelectasis and a pneumonia down the line. So I'm a big fan. Um, and I think that actually, oh right, and some other points to ponder for mucus plugging. And I'd also like to talk about just in general for respiratory management for our patients. Number one, a lot of our patients with their neurogenic bladder are on anticholinergic medications. So oxybutynin, tolteranine, solifenacin. And the big offender in my experience is oxybutynin. But the anticholinergics can thicken secretions. And so if someone is having an acute pulmonary problem, you may want to back that off or discontinue it for the short term. It's important to remember when you do your medical reconciliation to let the new team know that you stopped it temporarily. Okay? But you may want to stop it short term. Second, um, people who have high tetraplegia can be much more susceptible to rapid respiratory failure as they age um, because they, they are you know, having the normal decline in um, elasticity and muscle strength. And it's probably sort of like a smoker where they, they kind of drop off the curve a little bit. Um, patients who are using opioids or benzodiazepines may have decreased drive to breathe. I have tapered off I don't know how many people on their opioids and their benzos. Um, <clears throat> and some of the anti-specificity agents, um, which are, are suspect, and I, I know that actually the ICU team wrote up a, a case report on a patient um, who was using dantrolene, which is not a first-line agent for the management of specificity related to spinal cord injury, but in people who are refractory to the baclofen, the tizanidine, etc., dantrolene sometimes gets used. And as you know, dantrolene acts at the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's not selective. It's not going to say, oh, I'm only going to affect the spastic muscles. It affects all the muscles. And we have had um, a patient, the one who was, who was written up by Mental Negro at all, or I don't know who the resident was, but um, who could not wean from the vent until his dantrolene was tapered. And they took it off gradually, and he, his function gradually improved, and he was finally able to be weaned from the vent. And they watched his force vital capacity and his negative respiratory forces increase as he um, was weaned off the dantrolene. So it's really important to look at their whole medical picture as well, because our patients are frequently on a plethora of medications, and all of those interactions and side effects may be pretty significant when you are in the setting of an acute illness or exacerbation. So um, those, are, those are, I think, the, the key points that I'd like to leave you with. And then um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and, and see if anybody has any questions that I can answer. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Christy. We have time for uh, uh, some uh, some questions here. Maybe I could start by asking you for uh, patients who have tetraplegia, what are the key prognostic indicators independent of uh, 
of age, and, and what is the average life expectancy today of somebody who's a tetraplegic? Do we know? We, we, um, so for traumatic spinal cord injury, unfortunately yes. I don't have this table memorized. Mm -hmm. um, so for traumatic spinal cord injury, um, the, there's data, and I actually might even be able to link to this because, um, but in any case, the, the key prognostic, um, if I am examining somebody in an emergency room and looking for like how likely do I think it is that they are going to recover, number one, um, if someone has a cervical spinal cord injury, is are they complete or incomplete in the emergency room? Mm -hmm. For someone who has an incomplete spinal cord injury in the emergency room, meaning that they have either sensation in the S2, 3, or 4 dermatomes, or they have um, voluntary anal contraction or anal sensation. If someone has an incomplete spinal cord injury before anybody's even done anything, assuming nothing is worse, the sky's the limit in terms of functional recovery. So I have, currently have a patient who was very fortunate to be like in the MRI when his disc herniated the, the last bit. And no sensation, you know, no, no movement below, I think it was C5, C6. He got to the OR within two hours and he's doing stairs today. So it can be pretty dr dramatically different depending on, um, on what what there is. Now let me see if I can't make the link to the table because I think this is pretty fascinating and unfortunately it's pretty detailed and I don't have it memorized but I'd love to be able to pull it up for you. Um, if I can. Does this seem it does this have a um, internet link? Uh, yeah it does. Why don't you pull that up and we can open it up for other comments or questions. Dr. Chandra? So you mentioned thermal regulation is another complication with patients with spinal cord injury. So mm -hmm. how serious should a fever be taken? How serious is hypothermia taken? And if somebody is chronically and has had multiple admissions with the same issue, so is this a pattern that you see every time? And if it becomes a chronic uh, homeostatic homeostasis, so the patient achieves a state, steady state. So. Um, that's a very good question. He um, he asked about if I can rephrase this with the, uh, the dysfunction in thermal regulation. How seriously do we want to take um, fevers, and um, how often does it become a problem long term? So the thermal regulation problem stems um, primarily from inability to sweat and shiver. So we're unable to cool properly. Um, obviously the ventilation, which can also lose some heat, it may not be as good. And you're unable to raise your temperature because you're lacking, mo you may be lacking most of the muscles that would provide the ability to shiver. Um, and so for fevers, so we call it, we call it poikilothermia, is the, the scientific or medical name for um, the altered thermal regulation. Um, what I tend to see is I want to see a, def a definite pattern of fever because if I have a patient that is in bed and they are completely swathed in blankets, their temperature could be elevated. I would say, Dr. Richard, wouldn't you agree maybe not more than like 101? Right. I, I would say if it's under 101 and they take the blankets off and the person cools off and they, they don't have a fever after that. So it's, you kind of have to take it in that context. Now, um, there was an abstract presented, I don't think the paper has been published yet, um, a couple of years ago at ASKIP, where they looked at uh, whether the threshold for a fever is lower in people with spinal cord injury and infections. And there was some preliminary data to suggest, and there are patients that will tell you, well, my normal, temperature is 97, you know, 0.6. And so a fever for me is, you know, 100. So anyway, the, the preliminary study suggested that you may want to consider lower temperatures to be concerning. And um, so if you're over 101, that may be something to, to, um, to worry about. And that was um, Sunil Sabarwal who did that study um, at the, the um, Boston VA, 
if you're interested in trying to find find it. But I, I'm not sure if he um, if it's made it into regular publication yet. Dr. Armitage. Yeah. But how many VAs have this this focus? You know, a, a dedicated unit. I, know I saw your spokes and uh, there are 24. 24. So, mm -hmm. so the good news is one of 24 VAs in the country that has a focus in spinal cord. Yes. Yes. Um, and there actually may be. They're opening a new one in Syracuse. So I'm not sure if yeah, they closed just, one and yeah, if, so I'm not sure if the numbers are straight or not. And are the eligibility requirements the same as for any other segment of the VA hospital? So actually, that is an excellent question, and I'm glad that you asked it. Because the morbidity and mortality related to spinal cord injury is so great that assuming the veteran had an honorable discharge, even if they would not qualify for VA services otherwise based on income or the time in which they served, mm -hmm. because the VA can be pretty picky about that for your average veteran. If they have a spinal cord injury, they are automatically qualified for participation in the spinal cord injury system of care. And that is a huge, huge benefit to them. Because as insurance companies have become more and more um, I'm going to say stingy because that's what I feel like this is, okay? Um, I mean, they're trying to protect resources, right, and be sensible about resource utilization. But for a person with spinal cord injury, the availability of durable medical equipment, the availability of home modifications, means the difference between life in a nursing home and the availability of, of assistance makes it between life in a nursing home and a meaningful life in the community. And for those veterans who can participate in this spinal cord injury center system of care, we provide um, durable medical equipment that I never saw provided to uh, a patient when I was in my residency, and that wasn't even that long ago. So we would send patients out and we'd be like, well, go to Costco and buy a bedside commode. It'll probably be $40 if you're lucky, right? Yeah. And for patients with higher level injury, the um, shower commode chairs that we use are a couple thousand dollars. So it can be a huge barrier for a family to come up with that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really glad you asked that. Thank you so much for that question. Um, right, I'm going to keep trying to look really well, quickly. With that, aren't we, you know, because we're at the end of the hour, I guess, first of all, I want to thank you, Chrissy, for a great uh, uh, overview of a very important topic and uh, then invite people who are interested in a more detailed look at prognosis to come up to the uh, podium. So thank you again, Kristen. Thank you.